We are back. It would probably embarrass Gregory Peck to call him a superstar of motion pictures, but that's what he is. Uh, he's done so many great films, uh, Academy Award performance in To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, countless film classics, uh, Gentleman's Agreement, uh, The Yearling, Roman Holiday, The Guns of Navarone, and his current film called The Omen, opened around the country to uh, is zooming out of sight at the box office. It's a great pleasure to have him with us tonight. Would you welcome Mr. Gregory Peck? Now you're getting hit. You got to do something on this show. <laughs> For my first balance. <laughs> do you do you believe that man? He's fantastic, and he's a funny talker. Too. Yeah, he's really funny. Yeah, he is. <laughs> do they all talk like that in Cedar Rapids? Yeah, kind of. Well, I, yeah. he's got the Midwestern accent. But uh, you know, one thing occurred to me: he does that so well. But the question is, why? Would you? <laughs> but I guess just for fun, how are you? And it's a great I'm kick fine, to have I'm you fine. here. We, we, we're not too well acquainted. No, we see but, each other occasionally at uh, various functions, but we... Uh, a group. A uh, group, group type of thing. Yeah. But uh, you remember a little transaction that you and I had one time? I think you're referring uh, to a small rental? Yes, well, uh, you had this house in Las Vegas, which That's right. you used while you were performing there. And we didn't meet, but we had a little conversation on the phone. And I was going there to uh, make a movie, and it was the first time I was ever in Las Vegas in my life. I was going to make a movie in the desert outside the uh, right, Western. So we made this little arrangement, and the house was fine. And for the first week, we filmed during the daytime. And, uh, but at night, since it was our first time there, we went to every show there was, and we gambled and carried on. And then after a week, I guess we got to be Las Vegans, because that wore off, and we stayed home and barbecued the steak and, and did what normal people do. But if you remember, you had uh, three slot machines in the bar. That is true. That is and, true. And uh, in case anybody should misunderstand, wait till the end of the little story. Uh, and I got to playing those things. And, They're uh, all working slot and machines. And I got to losing money in them. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, was gonna, I was determined I was going to beat these Carson machines before I got out of there. So after a month, I'd put, you know, several hundred dollars. <laughs> and I, you know, I said, you know, it is, uh, don't you think it's a little tacky of Johnny to have these machines? <laughs> now they're tacky all of a sudden. <laughs> so uh, one night you called from New York right. and you were marvelous. You wanted to know if we were comfortable, if everything was fine, we we're happy in the house. And I said that it all was. But I said, I did put four or five hundred dollars into these <laughs> machines. And you took a long pause. You were amazed. And you said, didn't anybody tell you? And I said, tell me what? And you said, well, you just pull them out from the wall, and your money is in the tin trays, and, they're, and you, you can, That's the right. money all goes back to you. They're just for amusement. That's right. So I said, the, ba the back, I'd taken the back off, and the money right. goes into this little box. So I, I said, uh, he's not so tacky. He's a lot of class. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. I remember that. That's funny. You know, you, you are not the first person that got skinned on those machines. Uh, Bob Goulet was up using the house once, and uh, he hit the jackpot on the nickel machine, and it didn't pay off. Called you? And he called me yeah. and said, <laughs> called me long distance and said, I hit the jackpot, and I got nothing out of it. So I called the Sahara Hotel, where I was working at the time, and I had an armed guard take over $25, all the nickels in a bag, deliver it to him, and got a receipt. So I paid off. So those paid off pretty well over the years. Yeah. yeah. I just read in the trades today that the omen is, uh, like in the first four or five days it has been open around the country, is uh, just box office dynamite. Yeah, it's one of those things, uh, Johnny. Uh, I think if anybody could predict uh, the uh, box office take of any film, right. Any studio would pay them a million dollars a year just to, to get, have this, uh, uh, this information. You never know. Uh, it becomes a kind of a happening, and they're lining up everywhere, and uh, it has taken in uh, the kind of box office receipts that uh, the Towering Inferno, The Exorcist, and Godfather are taking in the first yeah. 10 days, and uh, there's no stopping them. You know, Sam Goldwyn, uh, one of his quotes, maybe not so well known, but it's the reverse of what I've just been saying. 
Goldwyn said, always said about a picture that didn't go, if they won't go to the box office, you can't stop them. <laughs> now, this, this is the reverse That sounds of that, like Goldwyn. Yeah. When you, you, know, you get a lot of scripts, of course. When you, when you read something, now, like Gentle, Gentleman's Agreement was one of the first uh, films, uh, I guess, made where it brought to the fact of anti-Semitism that had existed around the country. When you read a script like that, do you have any knowledge that sometimes this is going to be causes much of a furor or get the reaction when you read it, or you, you just take the role because you say that's a challenge and it's something different? Uh, I think I think you take it because uh, the script holds your interest, right. and uh, uh, interest never flags, and uh, it's a good story worth telling. If it has something extra to say, uh, as Gentleman's Agreement did, or To Kill a Mockingbird, well, you, you're glad that's a kind of bonus, that it's not only good entertainment, but uh, the audience can carry away something as well, something to think about. What was your first job as an actor? Very first speaking role. Uh, well, I was a um, um, guide at the... Uh, I was, I was a, a, a talker, a grinder at the World's Fair in front of a, 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 a thrill ride called the Meteor Speedway. Did uh, you we, do the we, spiel they were, Well, there were pitchmen, you know, and grinders. They call them barkers, but there are two kinds. And the, the elite are the pitchmen. They gather a crowd of 40 or 50 and they give a little show Sometimes they have a hoochie cooch dancer, or they have they have a they give a little sample of the show, and then they wave everybody in, and then they wait a few minutes. But a grinder, which I did, harangues the passing throng the whole time, and uh, the thing that I did was to be on microphone uh, every other half hour for 12 hours from noon to midnight at the World's Fair. We just try to. Uh, get them in off the midway uh, as they go. And then I, I went to uh, dramatic school uh, at a place. Uh, my classmates were uh, Tony Randall, uh, Ephraim uh, Zimbalist, and Eli Wallach. And uh, I got some good training there. Uh, at the end of the two years, you, they give a public performance. And uh, uh, hopefully, agents and producers uh, show up and then Hopefully, people will, will telephone. And the thing was that we all went back to the school, which was on 46th Street between 5th and 6th right. Avenue. And we would all hang around the telephone receptionist and wait for those calls that sometimes never came. But this particular morning after our show, uh, the phone rang. And we were, uh, there were 30 of us hanging around. And the receptionist covered up the speaker and said, she looked at me and she said, it's for you. It's Guthrie McClintic, and he's interested in you for a small part. And uh, he was one of the leading producers and the husband of Catherine Cornell in the American theater. And I knew where his office was, because I'd been hanging around there in everybody else's office looking for jobs. So I took off. I didn't wait to hear any more. And I ran down four flights of stairs. I ran half a block to 6th Avenue. I sprinted four blocks up to 50th Street to the RKO building. I ran into an open door of the elevator. I knew it was on the 18th floor. I shot up there, ran down the corridor, and Mr. McClintock's office door was open. And I ran in, skidded to a stop in front of his desk, and he was still talking to her. <laughs> and when he saw me, he, he slid right off of his chair. <laughs> and he, he, di he didn't stop laughing for about four minutes. And when he, he sat on the floor, and he said, he said He's here. <laughs> and, and when he re recovered, he said, you've got a job. So That's the way you get an acting job. Get in the office quick. That's funny. Let me do this. Look, I know you have to leave for the, for the theater night with your family. Can you stay a few more minutes? We'll do this first. Here's a message from Johnson's Wax. We do have a film clip also from the Omen, so stay with us. We're back. We're talking with uh, Gregory Pack and, uh, about the Omen, which is a... Uh, it's kind of a strange picture in a way, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very scary picture, I think. And uh, um, we've we've got a little film here. Uh, do you mind if I uh, you just need a little setup? Fill them uh, in a bit. Sure. Well, I play the uh, American ambassador to uh, Great Britain. Lee Remick is my wife. We've been married some time, and uh, and we uh, we have an adopted child. Uh, and uh, when he's uh, five, everything is going along very happily. Uh, suddenly, when he's five, he has a young nanny 
who, who at, a, at his fifth birthday party, a garden party, calls out from an upper story window, and she says, look, Damien, that, that's his name, this is all for you. And with that, she jumps out of the window and hangs herself. Uh, and uh, when I go to my office, incidentally, this scene was shot in the American Embassy on Grosvenor Square. The reporters are waiting, and they say, was she on drugs? I say, I don't know. I don't know why she did it. I go to my office. I'm somewhat distracted. And uh, a priest is announced, someone from Rome who's come to see me. And uh, I tell him to send him in, and that's where it begins. All right. Lots of monitors here in the studio. Here's a short excerpt from The Omen. thinking of the right word, ominous. It has yes. an ominous mood, the whole picture. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to ask you the outcome, and I know you have to run before you do. Hmm? You want me to do the commercial first? Yeah. All right, we'll do this, and we'll be right back. There's only one place you find the wishbone, wishbone name. <laughs> We're back. Thank you, Tom. We're talking with uh, Gregory Peck. Yeah. You have a lovely wife, uh, Veronique. We've met uh, several times, my wife, Joanna and I. She was a, did she do an interview with you when you first met? She was a journalist, I know. She was. She was a top reporter for the biggest Paris daily, the Francois. And uh, I went through there, and uh, I had a luncheon appointment with her. We did an interview, and I went off to Rome to make a movie, and I, I was struck by uh, uh, a bright and, uh, and a beautiful girl she was. Uh, and then I was, I was also impressed with the article. Someone sent it to me in Rome, and my French isn't all that good, but I, I could make it out, and I had somebody help me, and it was a clever, amusing, factual piece, and she had done it without taking any notes. Just, so I was impressed, and uh, six months later, I was back in, in Paris, and uh, I was a, a single for about 20 minutes there at the time. And uh, I, uh, I thought it would not be a bad idea to call this bright and beautiful young sure. lady. So I called her at the, at the newspaper. And, uh, and I had to venture into my uh, uh, rudimentary French. I, I said, uh, uh, Mademoiselle Passani, say Monsieur Gregory Peck. I, so I said to whomever had the phone, and all of a sudden, all the typewriters stopped, dead silence, and I heard over the loudspeaking system, Mademoiselle Passani, c'est Monsieur Gregory Peck pour vous, which is Gregory Peck for you. And uh, she came to the phone, dead silence. I knew that there were maybe 80 people <laughs> listening to every word, and I knew that she was already embarrassed. So I tried to make it quick. I said, look, you remember me? <laughs> well, so, Got off to a clever opening yes. that way. <laughs> she said, of course I remember you. And uh, I said, well, I know that the whole office is listening, so I'll make it short. Would you have lunch with me, maybe at Otai, the racetrack? And, uh, and uh, we'll see the races, and we'll have a nice afternoon. Not a sound. And I said, uh, are you still there? She said, yes, I'm here. And I said, well, uh, I'll repeat the offer. So I did, and nothing. And I said, uh, well, uh, I didn't think it was such a bad idea, but I'll try it one more time. So I did. <laughs> and I said, last chance. And uh, she finally said, all right. So we went. We had a wonderful afternoon. One thing led to another. And now we've been married for 20 years. But... <laughs> get... <laughs> you get applause? You get applause for that, yes. <laughs> but... Uh... I've never had applause like that. <laughs> Well, a few months later, I was courting her, as the saying goes, and I said one day, what took you so long to make up your mind? Uh, 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 <coughs> did you have a steady fellow, or did you have a big assignment that afternoon, or what? She said, well, to tell you the truth, I had an assignment, which was to interview Albert Schweitzer at the apartment of Jean-Paul Sartre, and I skipped it and went out with you. <laughs> so I had to marry her. <laughs> right <in fact. laughs> uh, uh, 
It's the only decent thing you could have done. <laughs> well, sometimes people say to Bernie, don't you regret giving up a very promising career to marry Greg? And she said, no. If I'd gone to see Schweitzer, I might be a widow in Africa today. <laughs> That's a wonderful, wonderful story. Hey, it's so nice of you to come here tonight. I know you don't do much television, and I, I thank you. I'm glad that the picture seems to be a big hit for you. Thank you very much. And thanks much. for coming tonight, and give my best to your lovely Veronique Queen. Well, they're right off stage. Okay. I'll give it to them right away. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. He is such a fine actor. Yeah. A style. That dude is suave. <laughs> that dude is suave? Yes. I think that's, that's the word, yes. All right, stay with us. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> yeah. 